All right, all right, all right. I'm trying something just a little different tonight with the board, as you can see. Uh, so welcome, everybody here. Welcome to those of you who are watching online. Uh, I did find, in case, in case it was just itching at you, I did find the metal holder so the little filter won't fall off our light this week. <laughs> In case anybody wanted to know, we did get that squared away. So let's see. Here we are. All right. How is everybody today? Good? Good? Awesome. I am excited about what God wants to speak to us tonight. It's something that's been just stirring in my heart. And so the goal for the whiteboard is not so much graphing or anything like that. It's more just listing because I have uh, a few scriptures we're going to go through tonight that chart the path of this thought. And so um, instead of me just repeating them throughout, I'm going to list them here. So hopefully you at home can see them and then we can also uh, write them back uh, or take note of them as well. So we're going to start. Um, we'll start in John. Take this with me. John chapter 1, verse 43 to 50. So you can start turning there. And, uh, oh, well, we could also do John 1, and that's 40 to 42. And then, wow, we're in John a lot. John 6, 8 through 9, and John 12, 20 to 33. And then we're in Acts. Sorry if this is weird for anybody on the camera. 4.13. And I think that's it for now, all right? So we've got these four scriptures in John, and then a scripture in Acts, and I'll be referencing as well Isaiah 53. Okay, so um, if you have your Bible, go ahead. You can start flipping there. I'll, um, I'll read them, but you can also... Flip there in your digital or paper version, however you see fit. All right, well, let's open with a word of prayer. And uh, we'll welcome those of you who are watching online. Welcome. Uh, let's, uh, let's go ahead and open with a word uh, of prayer, and then we'll dive right in. Lord, it's truly an honor, God, to sit in this seat and be able to unpack your word and lead discussion, and Lord, to carry the burden of this call of the gospel and, and this call to, uh, to sit in the seat. However it may be, Lord Jesus, I, I thank you for the honor. I thank you, God, for the honor that you bestow on all of us. Lord, to, by your Holy Spirit, be your mouthpiece to the nation. And so, God, we don't take that lightly, but our desire, Lord, is to dive into your word. Our desire is to learn from your word and grow, God, as we look into it. So Holy Spirit, would you just direct our conversation? Would you, God, direct our thoughts and our hearts tonight as we listen to you? And, and would you just have your way in this place as we exalt Jesus and we look for how you're leading and how we can grow in our relationship with you? So Father, we thank you and uh, we ask your blessing on all of it. In Jesus' name, amen. So lately, I've had this different longing um, and I say different, not in, not in that it's never been there or it wasn't currently there, but it's taken a different place in my heart lately. Um, as I feel burdens shifting and focus shifting and all of these kind of things in, in leadership and in, in, in what God's calling me to do, I've, I've found myself over the past few weeks just longing to be with Jesus and I don't mean that in a physical way, like, I want to go home to be with you, Jesus. I mean, instead of pondering about uh, strategy, how we can get better here, get better there, or how I can tackle this, or I'm not doing this enough, it's really boiled down to this really simple thing of, Jesus, I just want to, I just want to be with you. Can you just, can you just be with me? Can you, can you deal with me? Can you teach me? Can you heal me? Like, it's just been this really intriguing moment in my life. And like I said, it's not that it's not been there or been absent at any point. 
it's taken a different tone for me lately, and I think God does things at different times, but it's really changed my perspective on where our focus is, is and has been lately. So this is really a, a piece of the heart that brought me to this study tonight because I, I look at somebody like Isaiah, where he, Isaiah talks in Isaiah 53, very, very famous chapter where he talks about the suffering servant and everything that he will do and how he will carry people's sin and iniquity and set people free. Isaiah knew that it was all about that servant to come and that that servant, who we know is Jesus, would change everything. That servant would literally change everything. And so when I think about our relationship with God, sometimes I convolute this journey with all of these other things that, that are good in their own, but I miss this important key that it's the suffering servant, that, that it's Jesus that changes everything. He is the source of everything. In fact, I'll say this again later in our study, that the Holy Spirit's mission is to point us, what? Back to Jesus. And the Apostle Paul refers to the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Jesus. You know, it's not, it's not a ghostly figure that comes. It's the Holy Spirit that's sent, that, that imparts the character of Christ, and that communion with Jesus, and that intimacy and so as I began to reflect on that, that became a cry of my heart through, through these last few weeks. Just, Jesus, can you just, can I just be with you? <laughs> we, sometimes in the church, we, have, we think we have just the right line of things. You know, if I can just, if I can just pull myself out of bed and I can get to the church and, and if I can sit through Sunday school and and those are all good things. And I can hear the council and I can hear brothers and sisters and I can do all these things. And those are all great things and they should be in our life. But I think if we miss this primary thing where ultimately the center of everything we are, this desire that says, Jesus, can I just be with you? Can you just touch me? Can you just, can you heal me and teach me? So we see Isaiah just kind of peeking into the future here in Isaiah 53 as he prophesies about that servant to come that would change everything. Then in John chapter 1, verse 43, and I suppose we could flip these two around, but I want to I show you John chapter 1, verse 43 first, and then we'll go back to verse 40. Okay, so let's go ahead and flip there. You're probably already there because I wrote it on the board, but um, in John chapter... 1, verse 43 uh, to 50. This is a very unique experience that Jesus has here with Philip and Nathaniel. So if you read along with me, in verse 43, it says this. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from, from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathaniel and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good from there, Nathaniel asked? Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said, to, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me, Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than that. We'll stop the story there. You see this incredible interaction here with Philip and then Nathaniel. And I think sometimes we miss some really important elements about this interaction in our lives personally. Philip immediately knows that Jesus is the difference maker, the one everybody's been waiting for. Even in fact, he says it's written about in, in, in the law of Moses and in the prophets. This is the one, this is the one Isaiah was talking about. And Nathaniel is a little bit more reserved in his approach. So what does Philip say? And here's what I want to kind of key in on here. Philip says, come and see. 
Philip doesn't stand and try to debate and convince Nathaniel. Philip's response is, come and see. And this is where I kind of fall back to this, this thought of, I just want to be with you, Jesus. I think when we encounter people, I wonder how often we're, we're willing to just bring people to Jesus and let Jesus deal with them rather than us trying to force our previous ways or our system of things on somebody. Like, like Philip, can we just say, come and see? Look, I'm not going to try to tell you how everything's got to be for you because Jesus may have a different journey for you, but can we just come to Jesus and see? And if we start reversing the way we approach even evangelism and we say, look, let's bring him to Jesus and let Jesus work these things through. Now, what happens with Nathaniel here is it's incredibly powerful because Nathaniel asks, how do you know me? And Jesus' response initially is, I saw you under the tree. Nathaniel knows it's deeper than that because Jesus talks about matters of the heart with Nathaniel. Jesus says, look, here's a true Israelite in whom uh, there is no deceit. How would you know that by looking at somebody resting under a tree? You wouldn't. This is, this is an indication here. Jesus is seeing more than just the physical. Jesus here is revealing a bit about himself, and uh, Nathaniel here is captivated by that. And when Jesus tells him, I saw you under the tree, Nathaniel's response is, you are the son of God. This is a phenomenal thing that when we bring people to Jesus, Jesus is able to see Jesus is able to speak to, Jesus is able to interact and touch people's lives completely different than you or I could ever do it to turn that corner and bring that knowing that this is real. This is the real one. This is the difference maker. Do you see how, how important it is, this idea of being with Jesus? And, and so even though I talked about this desire in me to just be with Jesus, it rolled into this thought of how often do we try to push the scenario and do the convincing when in fact what's really neat is, is this moment with Jesus, like Philip, where we go, okay, fine, I'm not going to argue with you. Just come with me. <laughs> Just come. What if we started to rest on the fact that Jesus knows what he's doing and can speak a language to people that you or I can't and maybe can make that big difference that culture can't, that church systems can't, that eloquent words can't, but it's something dynamic that the King of Kings and the Son of God can speak directly to the heart of man and break walls down. What if, what if that were the case? Now let's back up here for a second. Let's, let's look at Andrew's uh, kind of introduction into this story. All right, so if you back up just a few verses, John chapter 1, verse 40 to 42. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who had heard that uh, who had heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, "We have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ." And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, "You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated as Peter." This is a really dynamic interaction before we even get to the Philip Nathaniel scenario. We see Andrew here leaves the apostle, uh, uh, I'm sorry, leaves John the Baptist, and he, and he begins to follow Jesus, and he immediately goes home, and he finds Cephas, or Peter, and he says, listen, you've got to come see who I found. We have found the Messiah. I need you to understand that what Andrew's doing here with um, with Peter, is he's going and he's saying, listen, I found the one who's changing everything. Clearly, these, these are raised Israelites. They've been waiting for the Messiah. But what if, what if we could become Andrews, who, again, back to the bringing people to Jesus, what if our verbiage was, listen, I found the one who changes everything. What if we could take a little from Isaiah and a little from Andrew and a little from Philip and we could say, listen, this is the one scriptures have talked about for centuries. This is the one who took everything we could never pay. This is the one who changes everything and he knows how to speak to you just right. 
And what about this? What about, he even calls you who you will be when you're still standing there as Simon, son of John. Can you see the power here? When Jesus looks at Simon and he knows who Simon will be, and he says, look, you're called Simon, son of John, but today you'll be called Peter. I wonder sometimes if we short circuit the process by getting ourselves involved instead of letting Jesus come and, and just introduce him to people and say, look, he's the one who changes everything. He's the one who can see who you're supposed to be and call you by your real name. He's the one who can look past your past and bring healing and, and forgiveness because he carried it all. He's the one who changes everything. What if we stopped trying to put our fingerprints on this whole thing and just started saying, can you come to Jesus? Like, this is the one. But that, that and here's the backside to that. That only works if you or I are convinced of it. If we've never been to Jesus, but we've just followed the, the rest of the crowd, and we've just gone along with the programs, but we've never sat in his presence and heard him call our name and let him wipe the shame away. There's something dynamic that happens there. And if we have those moments, that's where we can now turn and we can say, look, come see the one who changes everything. I'm not going to tell you how it's all going to work out, but I just need you to know who he is and he'll take it from there. But the, the incredible thing is Jesus he instructs us to continue to walk with them and teach them how to keep walking. After that moment, Jesus doesn't just say, hey, cut them loose. Jesus says, look, now that they've met me and I've shown them some things and, and, and spoken to them, look, you walk with them still and, and teach them and show them and, and be there with them. There's a dynamic interaction that takes place there as we bring people to Jesus. He does the work and we don't leave them. We walk with them from that point on but we let him do the work. There's a dynamic thing that's taking place. So we see Philip and we see Andrew, we see Nathaniel and we see Peter. Here, both in both cases, both are brought with the promise. This is the one we've been waiting for that changes everything. And in both cases, Jesus speaks directly to those people, to Simon and to Nathaniel in ways that nobody else could have then. So let me ask you a question. What do you think keeps us from being like Andrew and Philip? What do you think it is about us, about our culture, about church culture? What, what do you think it is that keeps us from being like Andrew and Philip that says, listen, I don't have all the answers for you, but I know the one that does. Let's, let me introduce you to him. And then show people how to stay in that relationship. What is it that keeps us from that? There are mics, by the way, um, if you have anything in the house. Hi, Brenda Connors. Great to see you. I'm not sure who all is else on there, but check in right now. Rem just a reminder, you can comment as well online, and I'll read those back. So what do you think keeps us from being like Andrew and Philip? Sometimes it's the analogy of what if Jesus had some bad things that were also highly public and everybody knew about them, and he says, come learn to be with Jesus. I feel like sometimes that's what it's like to say, come to my church. There's a lot of stuff I have to get through first mm. before they just say no. True. I'm the one where people did this, and I, I know you believe that. Maybe it's not either way. It's just another yeah, hurdle. Another thing. Yeah. But it just doesn't seem as simple to me. No, I would, I would grant you that. A at the same time, my, my, my next step would be, would be it, it, but it doesn't just let us off the hook either, you know. I think God is big enough by his Holy Spirit to be able to enable moments where we can. And maybe, maybe, 
maybe sometimes it's, it's a journey towards Christ before they ever step in the walls of a church. You know, maybe it's something where we're, we're being used in a longer introduction before it ever breaks through the walls of a church, you know? Uh, so there's definitely truth to what you're saying, but at the same time, I think we've got to be willing to keep trying. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, that's a good point. Go ahead. Um, I think our lack of vulnerability to share our story, mm. to be transparent, um, maybe share things that we don't want to share, like what God has done for us and not just show them, you know, this Christian front, but show them, you know, who we really were and who we are now. And it's not really anything to do with us. That's good. And I, I was going to sort of say the same thing that when, when they were bringing someone to Jesus, it was to the physical person. And what does that mean for us? Um, you know, is it come to church? Right. Um, because in, in some ways it isn't. When you invite someone to come to church, it, it, it doesn't have the same, it may not have the same meaning. And, and, and part of that also was kind of tying into what Christy was saying is how, how seriously we take what God has done for us when we then Good. ask people to come to Jesus, you know, because Good. so many of us have been on this Christian walk and yet somewhat in some ways it's not as, it's not as real as it should be for us. You know, it's not as deep as it should be maybe. So then how do we convey that to someone when it's not even that real for right. us? I mean, we're saved, we're following Jesus, but we're not having this these this powerful revelation the way that these 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 guys did when they went and then found their brothers or their friends and said yeah this is serious this is real we're more like yeah this is good for me and you know yeah. it could be good for you you know why don't you come sing some songs with us and see what <laughs> happens i mean and i think it's true also you know about maybe instead of talking about bringing people to church it's about bringing people into our lives and having a genuine relationship yeah. with them and letting Jesus impact them yeah. through us by by that daily interaction. Yeah, yeah, and you know what you said is 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 important because the word tells us it's by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony that we overcome, right? So our story and that vulnerability of our story and and how we can through that relationship and maybe not inviting people to church right away, but finding ways to reveal Jesus. Right? Clearly, we can't bring people to a physical Jesus, but we can find ways to reveal his might and the workings and the, the nature of Jesus and how he's freed us and what he does internally through testimony. But then that, that also enforces to me, if, if our walk with Jesus is superficial, how is anybody going to ever trust the words that are coming out of my mouth because it's not become personal? I think that's the most powerful element we have at play here is that personal, deep, meaningful relationship with Jesus that is impactful in our lives. It's not surface, but we do have moments we can speak of in transparency and bring people into that relationship. And in so doing, we reveal the nature of Jesus and his freeing ability to someone who so desperately needs it but may not even know, right? Right. So online, we have a couple, uh, couple statements. Elsa and Jasmine, great to see you. Elsa says, uh, we all too often point people to men, preachers, prophets, and politicians instead of Jesus. And, uh, and, and I, just heard, I just heard a statement the other day, which I absolutely loved. And while certainly we as preachers, and, and maybe we need to ask forgiveness sometimes because it, there is this element of, uh, you want to be personable. You know, you want people to, to be fed by how you're preparing or, or how you're putting work into your, the way you speak and, or even how you, you look when you get up there. there. There is some element to that, but maybe, maybe in the American church we've gotten that out of balance, and it's more about I go to this church because I like this preacher or I like the way he talks. Um, instead of going there to find Jesus in the community and, and worship together. And I heard about a, a pastor that regularly gets up and says, listen, if you're here because you like me, this may not be the place for you. But if you're here because you want to seek Jesus together with us, you're in the right place. And I, it just captured my heart in, in this mindset I've been in because I think that's a trap for pastors and even for people in general Hey, you'll love my pastor. 
well, well, great, but the goal is to get you to love Jesus with us, right? Um, and certainly I understand there's connections. I, I do get it. But you're, you know, it, Elsa's right. Too many times we go immediately to the preacher or the prophets or the politicians when Jesus is like, hey, I can, I can step in first. <laughs> I got something to say to them before they ever get to that point. And so, yeah, so sometimes we just lay back to let others do that stuff when God's maybe calling us to be that Andrew and be transparent and invite people to see what Jesus is and who he is. Jasmine says this, uh, uh, religion has become an intellectual or political debate. It's easy to fall into the trap of trying to win an argument and lose sight of the fact that we're not presenting a religion, but Christ himself. And I, I've said that for years, that I've never heard of anybody coming to Christ because they lost an argument. Oh, I'm all out of arguments. You've convinced me. <laughs> Any of us that have ever gotten to a sharp debate over any of these things, what do we see happening? Everybody just digs their heels in harder. I've never seen somebody walk off a debate show with any national, you know, apologetist that's well-skilled in their defense of the gospel and go, you know, that's it. I'm just flipping right now. <laughs> well, certainly it could be a step in the chain. Um, I think for us, recognizing the difference between bringing people to Jesus and, and revealing who he is through our lives, through our testimony, through our hunger, through our own experience, and arguing somebody into the kingdom are two totally different things that I think this culture is ready to receive. We're in a combative, argumentative culture that wants to create lines and debate. What if the church was, was that, what's the word? Vulnerable group of people. It's not necessarily afraid of losing an argument, but we're more concerned with introducing Jesus. Because I never saw Jesus lose an argument. <laughs> Jesus can come to those people in ways and speak things that you and I may never be able to. And um, maybe, maybe we're on the precipice of this, his church being positioned to use those ways in different ways, not, not argumentative battle lines, but tender, loving, transparency, vulnerability, revealing Jesus that could start a new Jesus movement in our day. How amazing would that be, right? Um, let's see. Craig, uh, Craig says, by living who we say we are. Well, that's a huge key too. There, I don't think there's anything that detracts more from Christ than somebody who says I'm a Christian but looks nothing like what Christ would look like to anybody that may understand who Christ is or may, may have any a semblance of knowledge of Christ. I think our words have to match our lives and, and our testimonies, though, have to be told. We, we have to be willing to be vulnerable and, and transparent and say, look, I don't have it all figured out, but look, look at what Jesus is doing. He's the one who changes everything. I was one way, and now look at my life, right? These are powerful concepts that we see at play, while certainly they are physically bringing to people to Jesus. I would, I would almost venture to say there's, there's just as much opportunity with the presence of the Holy Spirit, with people that intercede before walking into situations, with, with how God speaks and how God moves through his church. It, it, could, it could work just as powerfully, even though physical Jesus isn't standing in the corner. Um, well, certainly that means we have to be more receptive to the Holy Spirit. and We have to be more, you know, prepared to be the, the peace in the middle, but uh, trusting the Holy Spirit and the work Jesus may have. All right, so here, let's move on. John chapter 6. Let me show you another piece of Andrew. I love this piece here. John chapter 6, verse 8 and 9, right? This is where Jesus feeds the 5,000. So, uh, Verse 8 and 9 says, Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? I find this interesting that it's Andrew who brings the boy into the situation with the lunch. So we see Andrew bringing people to Jesus, but we also see Andrew here bringing this boy to Jesus going, Here's somebody with food, but 
is it really going to be enough for everybody? Andrew's uniquely positioned here, and, and certainly he didn't have any concept of what was about to happen when he says, is it even enough? But what, what I see here is that Andrew's willing to bring somebody to Jesus again. And, and it, it may look like, is this even enough to fill the gap, Jesus? I just think about this in so many different ways when I think about how we perceive a situation and how Jesus perceives the situation. Thank God Andrew didn't dismiss the situation because he just said, well, that's not enough, go away. But Andrew brings him to Jesus, goes, look, here's one. And the way Andrew sees it and the way Jesus sees it are two totally different situations. And for me, if we're gonna be Andrews, We've got to be able to look with faith, even if we don't see how those loaves and fish are going to feed 5,000 people. We still have to be able to bring to Jesus what's there. What if, what if it's something we've got in our own life and, and we're going, God, I've got this, but it's just not enough. And he's going, could you just trust me with it? Could you just trust me to be able to do what I do? You just come in obedience. For me, I think that's a key thing to us adopting this Andrew mentality that even if we perceive a situation one way, we're not the filter that keeps it from Christ. We should be the one that continues to bring to Christ and let Christ be the filter. Let Christ be the one that does the work. Let Jesus be the one that takes what people bring and make it more than it could ever have been before. I love that element. Not only does he do it with people, but he does it here with stuff. We can bring what we have, however big or little, and we can trust it in the presence of God. We can trust our gifts in the presence of Jesus. We can trust our, our finances in the presence of Jesus. We can trust um, our relationships in the presence of Jesus. We can trust all of these things and say, it might be meager, and I'm not sure how this feeds everybody, but here it is, Jesus. I love that element that we see here in this story. And so, uh, you know, Maybe just as an encouragement tonight. We may be looking at situations and thinking there's no way through it. But Jesus may be looking at the situation and go, is anybody going to step forward? Is anybody going to step in? I'm waiting. Maybe. I, I, I realize I'm adding liberties to the story, but you understand. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Now let's flip uh, to John chapter 12. Keep an eye on the clock there. John chapter 12, verse 20 through 33. This is a little bit longer, but I want you to see this. Verse 20, it says this. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice from heaven uh, came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it, said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the, uh, now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. This is a really beautiful passage of scripture and an engagement here between uh, this group and the Greeks that were there and Andrew and Philip and 
we, we kind of see this culmination of Andrew and Philip here bringing another group of people to Jesus in this setting. Jesus lifts his voice and he begins to speak. And in response, God speaks from heaven and, and they said, wow, it's, it thundered. Others said, an angel was speaking to him. And I love Jesus' response here. This voice was for your benefit, not mine. I love, just sidebar, I love that ability that Jesus has. He's like, hey, listen, I know the Father's voice. That wasn't, he was speaking to me, but that was more for you. I love that, right? So awesome. But here's the thing I want to key on here. They bring this group of people. They're clearly in this festival, and there's people around. And Jesus says this, when I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. I want to key in on this phrase and tying in this Philip and Peter mentality. We've just kind of, I'm sorry, Philip and Andrew mentality we've been seeing along through so far. Jesus' mission as he's raised up is to draw people to himself. I love that, that thought. While, while certainly we do face many challenges today, like we've talked about, the ultimate goal of Jesus is not to bring people into the church, the local assembly. The ultimate goal of Jesus is to bring people to himself. Why? Because he's the one that changes everything. The, the human structure of the way we do church inherently is not going to change a person. It's only the presence and the power of Jesus, the blood of Jesus that will set them free, that brings that change. And Jesus is keying in on this thing right here that he is going to draw all people to himself, not just the chosen people of Israel, but all people, not just the ones that think they're good enough, not just the ones that think they haven't figured out, not just the ones that have been born into the right family, but all people. And I love this mentality because if Jesus is recognizing this, we should, we should too, that there should be a drive to introduce people to Jesus to bring them like Andrew and Philip and say, listen, I found the one that's changed my life. And let me introduce you to him. Let me tell you the story. Let me let you in on what he's doing. What an incredible opportunity that we have. So let me ask you, hearing Jesus' words that he'll draw all people to himself, that's in fact the crux of the Great Commission, to go to all the ends of the earth and preach the gospel. Let me ask, have we, believers in this day, drifted from this call of Jesus? And if so, how? I think for me, let me, let me break the ice. I think for me, it's just been so much easier in my life to say, just come to church with me. While certainly at church, we trust the presence of God and the move of the Holy Spirit in the house and all of those kind of things, but I didn't have to bring them to church to introduce them to Jesus. And even today, You know, when, when people ask me, you know, what it is I do or what church I go to, and, and I talk to them about being a pastor, whoopee D. That's not changing anything about that. I, I, I still need to introduce them to Jesus. Jesus was lifted up so that all men would be drawn to him. And by virtue of the grace I've received and the covering and the blood and the freeing and the washing clean that I've experienced that's changed my life so deeply, how could I not? but I find it more convenient to just trust the processes we have in place at times than to step into that open door or the moment to say, can I just share with you who Jesus is? Can I introduce you to Jesus? So for me, that's become one of the things. I, I think I could say there's times we have drifted from it and there's times we haven't. And some of the ways that we do drift is we trust process and we trust organization or then we trust the king. For me, that's the way I saw. Oh, I spoke too long. 
Aw. Should I say all my stuff again and see if it comes back? <laughs> she got it. She got it. All right. She'd like to talk. Oh, okay. Uh, I think... I think it's, for me, like, I want it to be sophisticated and something intellectual and something appealing. It is appealing, but, like, instead of the foolishness of the cross, just preaching Christ crucified and trusting that and throwing it out there sometimes seems seems hard because, wow, like, that's all I'm telling them. Like, it, do you know what I mean? Like, mm. you want it to be something greater than it sounds i know that sounds terrible but it is great of course it is but in our flesh we want to am i making sense mm -hmm. yeah no that's good i think we discount it because we can't dress it up in all these beautiful ways and sound academic and all this kind of stuff when really jesus is like just bring them to me you know yeah that's that's a great that's a great answer No, I agree. And so there's some sense in which it's that and that. The sense in which it's not that would be, how is it that I talked to them and they didn't meet me? Good. So if I'm saying I didn't introduce them to Jesus, then how was I wrong? Right. Um, it's anyway, good. That means like an openness to the most deepest way I usually meet Jesus is prayer. Yeah. And so I know Christians who won't even pray to visit churches. They'll be like, oh, I'm going to pray for your brother-in-law or whatever they just walk away after they say the word yeah um and it's you know so i i think maybe sometimes that's a way good to start opening up and, and maybe another way you could think about it is because it might be lifted up is that you don't maybe want to talk about the, the scandal of your cross or whatever but as soon as i tell you jesus died for your sins they can get through the oh thank you for something great for me to what what about i need my sins and drink my blood, you don't have any part in me, a yep. hundred people left. They did, yeah. And so I, I, I'm sitting here going, maybe I should have, this is, the church isn't doing so bad, and we're just saying, this is what happens mm. with certain kinds of sores. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there were people that went, that guy's crazy. Yeah. They walked away. And there were people who went, that guy's dangerous. Mm. Right, we'll figure out how to kill him. And there were people who went, this guy's amazing. And then they went, oh, that must not have been what I thought it was. Mm. And I don't, so I'm all grumpy today, and I'm like, I, I don't, you know, in my head, every time somebody says, but we should just introduce them to Jesus, I'm like, I feel like that's some Christy means that just stops there, and nobody goes, okay, yeah. what did I just mean by that? Yeah. I bring them to a man instead of Jesus. Well, is that man a man of the cloth? You're bringing them to Jesus. Right. Is that, you know, I, well, I just told them about me. Well, you know, is, is Jesus in you or not? Right, so, right. There. Uh, Clearly, there's more to the conversation. I'm, I'm simplifying the process, right? I'm simplifying the idea around the idea of Christ, right? It's not, it's not human construct necessarily. And I understand his plan for the world does include the church, but it doesn't release us from our individual approach. And while certainly if we're walking with Christ and we encounter lives, like you said, they should encounter Christ, right? There, there should be something about us there should be the willingness to introduce him in prayer, to, to engage at different levels, all of those kind of things that I think sometimes we do shy away from. And, and we can ask that question, are we really doing those things or is it in word only? So, so there is some dynamics to what you're saying. And while certainly you're correct, the, the church is a organization that he uses to evangelize and to bring people into the kingdom. Um, it's I fear, I fear sometimes that we've lost the individual drive in place of the corporate. And, and that, that's where this comes from. Am I willing to expose what he's done in my life, be transparent, and be Christ in the situation so that they can meet Jesus? Or is it all just walls put up and say, no, no, you got to come here. And, you gotta, and while certainly that is tools, and sometimes it does make an impact, 
I think we, we have to recapture the personal burden of the mission and say, look, it's more than just invite. It's, it's living Christ in front of them. It's being willing to testify. It's being willing to introduce them to how he's changed and touched and how he can do that for them and not shy away. So I, I get what you're saying, but I think there's a, there's a combination there that, that is, is, is in the mix here. Yeah, I mean, we're kind of repeating a lot of the same things, I think. But, you know, I think about in my life, um, the easy thing is often to invite people to church because you invite them, and if they come, that's great. And if they don't, you can say, well, I, I tried. Um, I, I, you know, I did my part. They didn't respond. Um, the, the challenge is saying, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, like you said, you know, expose myself a little bit. I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm going to get to know the person. I'm going to sacrifice of my personal time and space to actually develop a relationship with that person. And no one wants to do that these days. I mean, you know, you hear stories of how people used to sit on their doorstep. People used to just go over people's houses right. without being invited. People would call people without having to text first to say, can you talk? It was all, you know, you, you just don't do that anymore. And so you're never going to, let's say never, I don't try not to use absolutes, but it's going to be hard to develop a relationship with someone if all you ever do is whenever you see them every couple of weeks, say, hey, that, that invite to church is still there if you want to come, and then you walk away again. I mean, that, to Ray's point, they're not seeing Jesus if that's all we do, because mm, Jesus completely gave of himself yeah, yeah. in order to, to, to create a relationship with someone. I mean, he, you know, and we just don't do that. You know, yeah. we have our little circle of friends. Even within the church, we don't, we don't create, uh, I don't create friendships the way I, that I should. I'm quite happy to just know a couple of people and say hi and then go home to my own little world. And so how do we, you know, how, how, do we, how, do, how does an outsider come in, whether it's into the church physically or into the, into, into the sort of the circle of Christianity if, and, and be drawn or attracted to it if they don't see anything different? Good. Just one more thing. Mm-hmm. Real quick, this is just a little testimony. <clears throat> Julie and I belong to the Gideons. <clears throat> and before the Gideons, yeah, we talk about our faith with some people. But when you belong to the Gideons, you have a stack of Bibles, and your goal is to get Bibles into people's hands and go to a certain section and explain to them um, the salvation message. And so we had a guy working on our house, and I have a stack of Bibles in my house, and when people come, you know, I, I pray, God, give me the courage just to give them a Bible. And he, this was his last day. And I said, um, can I ask you a question? Are you a, I can't remember, a spiritual man or something like that. And I said, can I give you a Bible? And it was just kind of, I, I gave him a Bible. And then we started talking and my husband was there and we entered into this conversation. And then he was talking about how, you know, he was from Eastern... Europe or something, and he had experienced all these terrible things, and he was obviously struggling with the idea of God. Yeah. And we just kind of worked through, like right there, we were just working through these things together and talking wow. about it. And he left with a Bible, and you know, it's in a sense, it's easy. Like, have a stack of Bibles, you know, be purposeful, give somebody a Bible, you know, can I share, you know, this? And I'm not saying that's going to work all the time with right, like right. intimate relationships and all that. But sometimes, you know, you have an opportunity, you want to seize yep. it because you might not see. And I've done it to people where they're like, oh, no, thank you. And then I will just say something. So a seed, you know, we're planting yep. the seeds. Yep. We're not doing the work. Yeah. You know, God is going to water it, make that's it good. grow and, you know, bring salvation. Yeah, that's and that's and that and that's, I think, what Ray was referring to, though. If we live our lives that way, they're going to see Jesus. They're going to meet Jesus, which is really the, the crux of this scenario is are we carrying that introduction with us in how we live our lives? Um, you know, to your point, Ray, I, I remember I was here one day and a, a guy was dropping some things off. And forget what he was, he was dropping off for the church and I had to go down and help him unload it. And he got in his truck and he started to drive away right here in the parking lot, and then he stopped, and I'm like, oh, he forgot something. He backs up, and he rolls the window down, and he goes, hey, can you pray for me? He goes, I, I, I have, I forget, he had some kind of, you know, incurable disease, Crohn's disease, or something like that. I forget what it was. He's like, I'm just really struggling, and I just want to be free of it, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll keep you in prayer, man, and, and he's like, thanks, whoop, and he just drove away. I missed a moment right there, you know, where he, he's looking for a touch from the Savior, 
I'm a spirit-filled believer who thinks that the Holy Spirit can do amazing things in the turn of a moment, and I missed it. These are the things, when I think about Andrew and Philip, this is where I'm like, can we be, can we be present and let the Holy Spirit just move us and be obedient so that those introductions in those moments, I have no idea what his faith journey was, but he knew he was talking to a pastor, and I had an opportunity just for that split second to introduce him. Now, certainly I did pray as I walked back in the building and all those kind of things, but I, there's something different when I could have paused for a moment and, and invited the presence of the Holy Spirit through our unity into that moment. I don't know if he'd have been healed, but he could have felt the touch from the Lord. And these, these are the encounters that I'm, I'm, I'm speaking of. These are ways that we, we have the ability to introduce people to Jesus outside of a sanctuary setting. And I think what would it look like if the first time people heard about Jesus wasn't when they came to church? What if they heard and saw Jesus before they ever walked in the door? I, it just intrigues me, this idea when I look at this and how Jesus so intimately engages with people's lives. So let, let's, see, let's see what some say online here. Jasmine says, in many ways, I think we become uh, very self-centered and focus on what Jesus can do for me. We become consumed with our own tangible, emotional, spiritual needs, and we become blind to the needs of others. I think there's some validity to that. I think we've got to let him start to change the way we perceive people. And instead of the church being consumeristic, what do I get when I come in? It becomes this thing, how do you want to use me, Lord? Is there something I can do for you? Even when we come to church, even when we um, you know, go to Bible studies, is there something I need to speak to somebody? Is somebody you want me to pray for? And we flip this thing back on its head and we begin to serve one another in dynamic ways, I think is a, is a really intricate uh, piece of this puzzle. Craig says, sometimes we make it more difficult than it really should be. I love that. Also says, if people saw Jesus in us every day, they would want to know why we're different. And that goes back to what Ray was saying. It, it could be just this visual representation that they see Jesus in us, and it creates the gap in the door for the next moment. That's huge. Um, Marvy says this, we have to allow Christ to live through us, listening to the Holy Spirit. So when questions are asked, they hear Jesus' response. I love that, Marvy. We're spirit-filled people, and Jesus sent the Holy Spirit for a purpose, what? To empower us as his witness, right? So that we can have the discernment of the Holy Spirit in those everyday moments to know how he's leading and to create those connections with him by his Holy Spirit. I think that's a powerful thing. We, we've got to get back to hearing the Lord's voice, like Ray said, in our prayer time. How are we cultivating that familiarity in our prayer time? Before we ever engage anybody that doesn't know him, how do we cultivate that so that we're available, so that we're feeling that, uh, that intimacy with Jesus, so that that connection is a natural connection, not one where we've got to dig back for the right words and we're trying to pull back some doctrine we learned somewhere it becomes a natural outflow of this vibrant relationship that's already existing for the introduction to take place. I, I just love that, that, that idea, Marvy. Great, uh, great statement there. Okay. Wow. I, I wasn't sure if I'd be able to get through all this, and we still have more to go. So let's, let's try to wrap this up here. Acts 4.13. This is one of my favorite scriptures. And um, this is Peter and John before the Sanhedrin. And it, it says this, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. This is the outflow of the intimacy I'm talking about. But it raises a question to me. In what ways can others see evidence that we've been with Jesus? If we see that in Peter and John, and we know that it's a real thing by our interaction and our intimacy with him in our prayer times, our worship times. What's the physical evidence, the outflow others can see in us? Julian. Um, I think this ties back to last week's lesson about Nehemiah where the king said, you know, you've always been happy around me sort of thing. Oh, yeah. And uh, I was saying to Christy uh, that when I think about my workplace, um, most people, if not everyone there, knows that I'm a Christian, but do they know it because I've invited everyone to church events or because 
the, I'm always happy at work. And mm. I, know, I know the answer, and unfortunately, you know, there's probably people there that have a, a better countenance than me and a better attitude, you know, handle, handle points, areas of frustration better than I do and show more kindness even at certain times. And, and I, you know, do they see Jesus in me? I mean, clearly there's times, no, and again, we're flawed. We're, yes, you know, yes. all of those things. I know all the, if you want the excuses, but the reality is that <laughs> they should see Jesus in me every moment of every day, regardless of what I'm, whether I'm inviting them to church or not. They shouldn't, I shouldn't have to invite them to church. You, you, when, when people say, I want what you've got, you know, when, yes, when they don't even yes. know what it is, but because of the yeah. way you are, and they, they don't go, even know what church I, you go to. Right. <laughs> I, I want what you've got. Yeah. They don't even know you go to church. They yeah, just right. go, whatever's, what is it? whatever's working in your life, that's what I want. Yeah, what medicines know? are you on? <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a great point. You know, that's one way that, that countenance changes about how we carry ourselves. The hope that we have spills out, you know, in a time when everybody's worried about everything and they're fighting over everything, but we come in with this hope-filled, Holy Spirit-filled demeanor that just looks different. It, you know, it carries a different fragrance, if you will, than the other people around us. I, while certainly we don't, the Word doesn't tell us what the physical evidences were that they used to identify they had been with Jesus, there was certainly something about them their wisdom, the way they carried themselves, the way they spoke, they're, they're, the Holy Spirit's leading in that moment, the anointing on them, all of those kind of things. Um, these are important things for us as we look saying, when we lean into Jesus, it's going to impact how we introduce other people. So this kind of goes back to that heart at the very beginning. I, I've got to wrap it down, but it kind of goes back to that statement at the very beginning of how I said, I've just had this longing to say, Jesus, I just want to be with you. Because I know the longer I'm without that presence and that intimate touch, the more I start to lean into my own way of doing things. And, and I, as I was praying through the day and leaning into this word, I really feel like there's, there's a season where believers now are being called back into this intimacy with Christ. Not process, not structured church, which are all good things. But all of those mean nothing without Christ. So for us to be reaching for Christ again, that, that intimate moment where it's Jesus, I, I was just praying this just over the last couple of days. Jesus, teach me. I have books on my bookshelf and doctrinal books and theology books and studying, and I'm always trying to grow. But there's something about that sitting in the master's presence and saying, teach me, Jesus that teaches me how to react. It teaches me how to handle things. It, it teaches my heart how to process. It's, it's something that I can't learn in a book. It's something that's beyond. Jesus, be my healer. Heal the wounds I've been feeling. Heal the, there's all of these things that take place when the believer steps into that presence with Jesus and we say, Jesus, be our counselor. Jesus, be our strength, be our provision, be our savior, be our hope, be everything. Change everything, Jesus. I think it's time for the church, and by church I mean us individually, to start reaching and leaning into the presence of Jesus again with the purpose of saying, I just want to be with you. Can you teach me? Can you heal me? Can you lead me? Can you take those wounds that have been laid wide open that bleed so easily? Can you close them? Because as we do that, as we lean into the word and as we lean into his presence, we see Christ revealed in the word. And in his presence, we hear and we feel Christ revealed by the Holy Spirit. And there we find that communion as the Holy Spirit allows us to sit in Jesus' presence by virtue of this eternal, beautiful connection, which is why I think Jesus knew so desperately why we needed the Holy Spirit. And it's such a beautiful gift for us. So um, be encouraged tonight, whether you're watching online or you're watching here in the house. Um, while certainly there are processes we continue to use and the church has a purpose as an organization, we can't lose the value of our individual calling to introduce people to Jesus through how we live, through how we interact, 
through our exposure to Jesus that keeps it vibrant and tangible as we intersect the lives of other hurting people, that they can see a difference and they see the hope of the Savior all around and all through us. And by so doing, we bring people into an introduction and we stand there in the moment with the Holy Spirit like a Philip and an Andrew that says, look, we found the one we've been looking for. That's a powerful moment. And I think the church, I think it's time we start leaning back into it and see what Jesus will do in our day. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for your sweet presence here in this place. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that fills and empowers us. God, we pray for more. We pray, Lord, that, that we would lean into your presence in these days, that Jesus, we'd sit with you and you'd teach us and you'd heal us and you'd fill us by your Holy Spirit and you'd empower us for mission. God, help us not to be self-centered. Help us not to be consumeristic in our approach. But God, we'd be servants that would model after you, the great suffering servant. Lord, let us be people that make introductions in our lives on a regular basis for your kingdom and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you to everybody here. Thank you to those of you who are watching online. We love you, and uh, we'll see you on Sunday. Have a great night.